Uh, the recording has started. Uh, I will make this recording available to you in the announcements after class is over. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen so we can pick up with where we left off last uh, on Monday. So you should be seeing the class uh, page now. So I'm still getting emails from folk uh, who obviously missed all of last week and for whatever reason didn't join us on Monday asking, what do I do in this course? Well, if you log into Canvas, which I hope that you have done by now, you can see that there's a big blue start here. If you follow the instructions and information beneath the start here, recognizing that you have missed week one and you cannot go back, then you should be able to, um, you know, start with where we're at now, week two, and continue forward. Um, I always post a link for the class meeting. Um, in the announcements, ah, but but I, I think I did forget to post one for today. But fortunately, you guys made it. Uh, give me just a moment and I'll get I'll post a link for those people who might be looking. So yeah, I just. I have to get back in the habit of remembering to do that, so bear with me. So well, let me catch that link out of there. This is just so I can help out somebody who might be looking for how to get into the class today. My apologies if I made you uh, hunt for a link. So I suspect most of you use Monday's link. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah. OK, so let me let me do this, because if I pick up today's link, it might it might send um, them to a different room. So let me do this. The way they have the same link that everybody else has, and it's just a different recording, so it's no big deal. All right. So that should help out those folk who are looking for us right now. I do apologize for uh, not remembering to get that out there to you. Um, so again, after the class is over, I will post the recording. And if you noticed, I've been posting the recordings for all of our team meetings. Um, you know, the meeting we had last week and uh, Monday. Sorry about that. I got a three year old and a six year old playing in the next room and they want to get a little bit rowdy. So I had to kind of calm down for a minute. All right. So um, if you have not uh, sent to me the last page of the syllabus, please make sure you do that. Uh, you can get the last page of the syllabus by clicking the syllabus link and going into it. Uh, also, for those of you who did do week one, but for whatever reason forgot to send it to me, this last page of the syllabus is also available in week one because you were supposed to get it back to me by last Saturday. So uh, one of the things I'll be doing here in the next few days is to look at my lit, uh, roster because right now it's in a little bit of a flux. You know, students are adding, dropping, moving to different sections, what have you. 
and then I'll start to look at who I have a syllabus page from. And then if I don't have yours, then I'll have to reach out to you individually. So save yourself some trouble by going ahead and getting that to me, uh, you know, as quickly as possible so that I don't have to, you know, hound you for it. OK. All right. So we started dealing with the nature of science on uh, on Monday. And one of the things I said that I would do for you today before we move forward is to go ahead and introduce you to the project. That way you can start uh, working on it. So uh, there's a variety of ways you can get to the project. Of course, anytime I'm going to talk about it, I put a link in the weekly overview. Um, and then, OK, let me see. I've got some folk trying to get in. There we go. All right, so I put a link in a weekly overview, but you can, um, if you if you look in the actual weekly overviews, uh, you know, uh, set up there. There's links to the project here, okay. And also, um, if you go in assignment and activities, the project is there. You can get to it that way as well, okay. So you know. Um, the main thing is you want to go and start to take a look at this stuff. So that's what I'm going to do with you right now to get you started. So it says here in the directions, of course, you know, with everything that I do, I give you. Um, oh, it says somebody was waiting in the lobby. Let's see. OK. No, nobody's waiting. Oh, there we go. OK. Sorry, there are people popping in the lobby and I'm, I have to admit them if they show up. All right. So um, as with everything that we do, I always uh, give you the goals and objectives for what you're going to be doing uh, in that particular assignment. So with this assignment, uh, you know, it serves a couple of purposes. Number one is to familiarize you with uh, lib library and internet resources uh, that you um, to help you in your search for the article that you have to summarize. Um, you know, and once you find it, you have to be able to determine if it's useful, and then you summarize it, and then you relate it to stuff that we cover in class, and um, the other go. Uh, objective here is that you become familiar with uh, APA format. OK, so those are the reasons why I have you do this project. You know, of course, you know, with anything that I have you doing here, the goal is to increase your awareness and understanding of physical science. So that's definitely a part of this whole project. OK, so beneath that you have the directions. And I'm covering enough to get you started. Periodically, I'll come back to this. But nothing substitutes for you doing your own reading and and you know formulation of your own questions that you might have about this project, okay? Because uh, you know I'm sure along the way you will have some, and I'm more than willing to address your questions, okay? But you need to read this stuff first, okay? says a peer reviewed research journal article is to be read and summarized in your own words. I can't stress that enough, your own words. So you're going to be looking for a peer reviewed research journal article. You're going to read it and you're going to tell me what it's about. And then you also have to tell me, you have to clearly communicate to me how the article relates to what you have studied in lecture or lab depending upon which class you're in. Here, please pay attention because I can't tell you how many times I get asked this. If you are in lecture and lab, you must do two different projects. So if you're in lecture and lab, you're looking for two different articles. You have to read them, summarize them, tell me what, what they're about in your own words, and you tell me how it relates to your lecture or lab class, depending upon which class you're, you're doing, uh, you know, you're, you're um, working on, all right? Your article has to be related to astronomy, motion, which we call mechanics. I mentioned that on Monday that we deal with Newtonian mechanics, which is 
uh, a study of motion utilizing Newton's laws, energy, waves, or thermodynamics, okay? So your, your article has to be on one of these topic areas. And let me even be a little bit more specific. You have to approach these, artic these topic areas from a science perspective, okay? You're in a physical science class, so your article should have some physical science connection. Uh, in other words, I don't want to know the economic feasibility of wind energy in Czechoslovakia. That's not a science article that, you know, relates to anything we're dealing with in this class. If you're in an economics class, it'd be great. I don't want to know about, you know, um, philosophy or I, a lot of students get uh, archaeology and astronomy mixed up. I see students go and look for astrology. Uh, no. These are the topic areas that your article has to be connected or related to. Okay. Now, so and so let me let me just be a little bit more uh, specific so we know exactly what, you know, we have a little bit more clarity. This peer review research article is um, a, an article written by a scientist who has done research. So they've done some research. They want to share it and communicate it with the rest of the world. So they publish it in these journals. So your task is to find one of those articles, okay? And when you find it, it has to be related to one of these categories from a science perspective, okay? And then you're gonna read it and tell me what it's about, okay? Now, um, let me talk about how you can find these articles, okay? So we know what you're looking for. We know one of the categories you know, one of the things that it has to be uh, uh, standards that it has to meet. Let's talk about how you can find them. It says several acceptable articles can be found by using the electronic databases at the college library of your choice. So either our library, which you have a link to right from Canvas. Okay, that's one avenue. Or if you are cross enrolled or you have a you know, uh, a connection at another college library and you want to use their library, that's fine, okay? But you're looking, you're going to have to search the electronic databases to find an article, okay? Uh, you can find these articles online, but many times when you find them online, you have to pay for them. And I don't want you paying for anything that you can get freely from, um, you know, RPCC's library or another college's library, okay? Um, you can also go to this website that I bookmarked and find and find articles, okay? Uh, Hindawi makes their articles openly available to uh, you know anybody who wants them. You just go to the website, uh, click on a search box, tell it what you're looking for, and it spit, it'll spit back whatever it has, and then you have to look through them to find one that's related to these categories, okay? All right. Again, the article must be peer reviewed, meaning that it's a research article done by an actual scientist. It's not a news report on science. It's an actual research article on science, okay? And how you, you know, one of the reasons, one of the ways you might know that it's a science, you know, it's a research article is that it will be set up in a similar fashion to the scientific method that we talked about on Monday, okay? It'll have an abstract, it'll have, you know, it'll explain what they're doing, um, it'll explain the procedure that they follow, the question and hypothesis and all of those things that you see in the scientific method. For those of you who are in my lab class, you'll see that it follows very cl closely to the format that we use for our lab reports, okay? So that, that can also guide you. But I'm not interested in science news articles or, or things like that or, or items from science magazines. No, research journals, okay? So uh, you can also use the Scientific Researcher app and uh, you can search the Play Store or the iTunes Store. And uh, this is the logo for the Researcher um, app. That's how you'll know when you found it, okay? All right. So these, you're looking for research, a peer-reviewed research article. 
You have to tell me what it's about in your own words. You have to tell me how it's related to the class. If you're in lecture and lab, you're doing two different projects. These are the categories that it has to be related to. You have avenues for finding it, either the college electronic databases. Uh, you can use the website that I provided here, or you can use this app. Now, there are other avenues, but I've given you three that you can depend on to be you know, in the right ballpark when looking for these articles, okay? All right, the other thing that I, you have to be uh, mindful of when you're looking for these articles, your article, please do not confuse the article with the summary that you have to write. Your summary is gonna be much shorter, but the article has to be a minimum of 15 pages long, not counting the references. So let me show you what I mean there because sometimes students don't understand what I mean when I say not counting references. So I'm gonna bring up just a sample article and you know this is by no means a sample of an article that you can use. I, I'm gonna go in medicine and um, let's see, I'm gonna click on, uh, let's see, oh, there's a search box here and let me type in, um, medicine so here's an example of an article on medicine there's not anything that you can use but it's an example of an article because i want you to see what i'm you know when you use this site some of the particulars right so you can download the full pdf that's the nice thing about hindawi all of their articles are, are available for you to download okay but you can also you can also look at it right here online but um the only way you know how many pages it is is to actually download the full pdf okay so here's an example of a, an article. We can see right quick that, that that's not 15 pages long. But when I say 15 pages long, not counting the references, you see the references on this article start on page nine, okay? For your article, the references have to start on page 16. If they start, if the references start before page 16, I'm not gonna accept it. I'm gonna tell you it's too short, okay? So that's how you know if your article is long enough. You look at what page the references start on. If it doesn't start on page 16, it's too short, okay? So when you send me your articles for approval, I'll look at it and see, is it a research article? Is it on the right topic? Is it long enough, okay? If it meets those three standards, I'll send you back an email and I'll tell you, hey, you can use the article. If it's not, I'll tell you no and I'll tell you why, okay? So to get your article approved, you have to email me the full PDF. Don't send me a Word document. Don't send me a link to the article. Download the full article and email the full article to me as a PDF file, okay? I'll look it over and get back to you, okay? Um, you have until the 13th of March in this class to get that done. Uh, lab class, for those of you who are, you know, in both, Lab class might have a different deadline date and a due date. You need to make sure because um, because of the time frame that I have to work with lab classes, uh, you know, I have to adjust things a bit. OK, but in this lecture class, you have until the 13th of May, 11, uh, excuse me, 13th of March, 1159 p.m. to get your article approved and to get it approved, email me the full article. Just like I just downloaded the PDF, you do that, email it to me. I'll take a look and tell you if it's long enough. Please pay attention to this. If you do not get an article approved by the deadline, meaning um, Sunday, 14 March, 1200, I'm done approving articles. And if you don't have one approved, not emailed to me, approved, you automatically lose two, 20 points on, uh, on your project score, okay? So you'll wanna go ahead and try to, you know, not to run up on this deadline, for getting your article to me because it does take some time to find one. And once you found it, it does uh, take some time to read it uh, because they're not they're not very easy articles to read. OK, and, uh, you know, so you want to send it to me and and uh, get your article approved prior to the deadline. All right. So are there any questions on how you get started with this project? We'll talk about the writing later. But let's talk. Th this is just about. What do you do to get your article, get a, find an article and get it approved? Questions? 
All right, so hopefully that's enough to get you started. If you're working on, uh, you know, looking for an article and you need, uh, you have questions, you know, just reach out to me. I'm more than happy to answer any questions that you might have. All right. So on Monday, um, I looked at this, the nature of science. Okay. I looked at the nature of science. We talked about things like, um, you know, basically what is science, you know, and, and uh, how, how do scientists go about their work? We looked at uh, physics in particular because that's the topic area that we deal with uh, in this class. Uh, you know, even though physical science includes chemistry, we focus on physics and not chemistry. OK, we looked at the, you know, the, the, the idea of uh, models, theories and laws and talked about how they're, you know, how they're useful in science and and uh, and, you know, and what dif uh, what's the difference between the two a theory and a law. OK, uh, as I mentioned, we looked at the scientific method. I looked at a sample of utilizing the scientific method. OK. And then we just talked about some of the history as, is, uh, you know, as it pertains to physics, you know, the idea of the Greeks and then, you know, uh, Galileo and Newton's uh, uh, time period and then modern physics, you know, when we get into Einstein and things where we start to really have a more more of an understanding of the atom and what have you. OK, so that was just, a, you know, our introduction to the nature of science. So you would have some foundation and background, um, you know, as to what your what what's your what's your neck of the woods in this class, if you will. OK, all right. You know, the question I, I am I'm seeking to answer for you is, in this body of information is how did that stuff get into the physical science book anyway? So, you know, what's in there and, and how did it get there? Right. And so, you know, one of the things, the last things we talked about was this idea of, you know, uh, the importance of experimentation. And I mentioned to you, uh, you know, the experiment is an organized procedure for testing a hypothesis. And, um, um, you know, the, the the experiment has as, as part of its process data and analysis and that data and analysis portion of the experimental process is where we start to really focus on this concept of measurement. So uh, as I mentioned to you on Monday, he, these are the, the notes here are all for your use. Uh, the supplemental notes are my lecture notes, and I make them av uh, freely available to you. So I'm going to go in now and cover um, the supplemental notes on measurement. OK. All right. And the goal here is for us to introduce the concept of measurement. And then on next week, we're going to focus on this idea of measurement again. But we're going to look at the idea and the process of doing unit conversions. OK. All right. So the day this is working on Monday, I was having trouble with it. All right. So again, in each of these packets, it reminds you on how, you know, how you can most effectively study the material that we're dealing with. Uh, and you should take heed of that. OK, so the whole goal for using this packet is what? For you to recognize the SI base units and prefixes. That's what we're focusing on here. OK. So. We have to get comfortable with some turn up terminology. OK. Um, as I said to you, the, um, in in physical science, I call it, you know, Monday I refer to it as what scratch and sniff science. We try to move away from these touchy feely explanations of our physical environment. You know, science is only one way of looking at our physical environment, right? I mean, we can look at our physical environment from a English, uh, you know, or, or, um, uh, literature, or poetry, or music. We all of those offer us ways to interact and explore and explain our physical environment, but those. Um, those descriptions of our physical environment uh, can be interpreted differently by different people. And so the goal of physical science is to offer a more quantitative description of our physical environment that people can agree on because we have a standardized way 
of explaining or quantifying it. And that standardized way of quantifying involves measurement. And to make sure that we're all on the same page when we measure, because conceivably people can measure using whatever method or technique they want, right? But we standardize that by having what we call unit systems, right? And so um, uh, in, in, in physical science and, and particularly in physics, we focus on the metric system or the system international, right? the SI system of units, okay? And so that's what we're gonna be moving into helping you to understand in this material, all right? So it explains to you this kind, the idea of a physical quantity. Sometimes you will hear, hear it referred to as a physical property, okay? All right? So a physical quantity is a characteristic or property of an object that can be measured or else calculated from other measurements. So we can measure it and then we can, um, you know, take those measurements uh, that we made and combine them and make other properties, okay? So we call that base properties or derived properties and we'll see here the difference, okay? All right, so, you know, uh, this, this whole idea of a physical property or a physical quantity is something that we can measure. And when we measure for our purposes, we're focused on utilizing the metric system to do that, okay? All right. So now uh, we are not gonna get into the idea of, uh, you know, how, how a, a unit can be interpreted, okay? But, you know, what we need to understand is, what what are the units, okay? So in other words, part one property in the SI system is length. And we can use a meter as our base unit to, de to, defi to quantify length, okay? But we're not, I'm not gonna push the issue here of having you know what's the definition of a meter. For that's and that's what I mean. Okay, all right. So um, we 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 want to go to this quantitative description because do we leave out the chance for ambiguity? For example, you and I might walk into a building and both you know we're both in the same physical space. But you might say it's hot in here, and I might say it's cold in here. But if we both walk in, walk over to the thermostat and say, oh, it's 75 degrees in here. You see, 75 degrees Fahrenheit or, you know, then we rule out the chance for ambiguity. It's not open to interpretation. 75 degrees Fahrenheit is 75 degrees Fahrenheit no matter where you're at in the world. Okay, so, <clears throat> so let's get to this idea of units, right? So again, this whole idea of units allows us to standardize our measurements. So we're all on the same page, okay? So in the SI system, in the SI system, we are going to be focusing on four fundamental properties, okay? Four fundamental properties, all right? And those fundamental properties are, they do electric current, but we don't study electricity in this class. Our four fundamental properties are length, mass, time, and temperature. Length, mass, time, and temperature. Those are the four fundamental properties that we use to describe our physical scratch and sniff environment. So we can measure an object's length, or we can measure the length from one place to another. We can measure an object's mass. We can, you, we can measure the time that it takes from one event to another event. 
And for our purposes, and I'll have to go back in here and change this because I don't like the idea that they mention electric current because I want you to be confused that that's something we focus on. Um, temperature. And we know that we're going to see a more refined definition, but in our mind right now, at a basic level, temperature allows us to measure what? How hot or cold something is. Okay? All right. And so we can measure these four fundamental properties with four fundamental units. And these four fundamental units are form what we know as the SI or metric system. Okay? So for length, the fundamental unit, or we sometimes say base unit, is the meter. For the fundamental property or quantity, mass, the base unit or fundamental unit is the kilogram, not the gram. That's chemistry. Remember, we'll focus on physics. For time, the fundamental property or quantity, time, the base unit is the second. And for our fundamental property, temperature, the base unit, the base unit in the SI or metric system is Kelvin. Okay. There are other unit systems. I mean, of course, you know that because in this country, the United States, we still widely utilize the e English units or sometimes you hear called imperial units, right? But in this class, our primary focus is on the SI system or the metric system, okay? So, um, this table shows just what I've been talking about. So uh, uh, in your notes, you, you scratch out electric current, you scratch out ampere, and you write the word temperature, and you write Kelvin, and it's abbreviated with a capital K, right? Now, <clears throat> let's get to this idea of metric prefixes. So <clears throat> in our um, you know, in the process of measuring things, it would be great if every time we measure, we got one, one meter, one kilogram, one second, one Kelvin, every time we measure one. But you know, in practice, that doesn't happen. That doesn't happen. When you measure, sometimes you will get more than one and sometimes you will get less than one. And so uh, what we do as notation to simplify our communication, because as I mentioned on Monday, one of the key elements of science is this business of communicating the knowledge that you have to the rest of the world. And so to have a common understanding we utilize these prefixes. And, and the reason they come in handy is because they allow us to multiply our base and powers of 10 or express fractions of our base in powers of 10, okay? You know, 10 is a nice number because you got what? Typically 10 fingers, 10 toes, right? That's, you know, a lot of this has its stuff, stuff is, is development in, a, in, you know, a historical perspective from you know, just common everyday experience, right? 10 fingers, 10 toes, all right? So you see here, let me see if I can zoom it in a little bit more. Um, yeah, there we go. I think I can zoom it in a little bit more here for you. You can see that there's a prefix and there is a power of 10 that goes with it, and there is an abbreviation. Now, here's what I always tell students. It's important that you understand uh, the, that the idea of a prefix means it comes before the base, it comes before the base. 
So let me see if I can bring up another screen here. And uh, I just like to use this one. Bear with me for a second. It's just a simple whiteboard tool that I use sometimes. All right. And so, for example, <clears throat> I had the experience in one class before. This was been this been a while now because uh, you know it's been a while since we've had a face to face class. So I asked the student, and, and, and let me be truthful to that student. Okay, I asked the student, because we were taking turns practicing with the idea of metric prefixes. And I asked the student, I say, okay, your turn. What, what does this represent? If you see this measurement, we measured the length of something, and this was our measurement. Please tell me what this stands for. And the student said, honestly, 10 milli milli. Okay, now, um, I recognize that it's a learning process, but to me that communicated a uh, lack of a fundamental lack of understanding of the role of a prefix, right? Because in this situation, milli is the prefix, and this M stands for meter. Millimeter. So the prefix comes before the base. So uh, I had a student that wrote this. Um, for me once. I, I asked them, you know, they were doing an experiment and they had to measure and the student wrote this as the measurement, five gram kilo. Again, that rec represents a fundamental disconnect because the kilo has to come first because it is in fact the prefix, okay? Now, each of these prefixes has a power of 10. And each of these prefixes has a, an abbreviation, OK? And it depends on how you choose to communicate. A lot, some students like to write things in scientific notation. I am perfectly fine with that if you're comfortable with it. Um, but you can always use the abbreviations for the powers of 10. I do not ask that you memorize these. This class is not about memorization. I provide these to you because my goal is for you to use them, use this chart as you need to. Uh, we will not use all of these prefixes. Uh, there are only about six of them that we'll use on a regular basis and you'll get familiar with them over time, okay? But, I always tell students, you are more than free to pull out this chart, have it beside you as you're working, whether it's homework or an exam. Use it. That's why I gave it to you. Okay? So, but what you want to be able to do is to utilize it effectively. The other reason why this comes in handy, <coughs> let's say that I was writing a report and I had to write one billion. You know, let me keep adding, All right? All right, because you know, if you remember how you did things back in grade school, you know, the teacher always wanted you to put your commas there to, to, to signify the place values, right? Okay, now just imagine you had to write a report. And every time you needed to write one, one billion, you had to write this whole number out every single time. Well, all these zeros. That introduces the uh, possibility for a mistake, right? And we talked about the idea of mistakes in lab class yesterday, this idea of a mistake. And it makes communicating cumbersome. And so that's, that's also the value of having this kind of, you know, abbreviated format for communication. OK, so sometimes because we measure more than one and sometimes because we measure less than one, these powers of tens and their associated prefixes are very, very useful to us. OK. All right.
Now we'll come back to this idea of unit conversion um, next week. And, and you know, this whole idea of significant figures will become uh, you know more more pressing when you start to do homework. But let me just say something to you to simplify your life tremendously. In this class, when you are calculating things for me, two decimal places is more than enough. We don't even need to bother with this if significant, this, that, and other. Two decimal places. Good enough for government work. All right. So I want that's what I wanted to cover in this packet. But now I want to take you out and show you something that I sent to you. Yes, uh, Monday when I sent you the recording. And this is a very good tool to have at your disposal. I'll just open this link first. OK, this link has you have access to all of notes on every topic that we're going to cover. So I've provided you access to an additional set of notes. I call them extra because even if you don't use them, you can still, you know, you'll, you'll have what you need. It's, it's just like I like to give you access to as much as possible. OK, but I don't post these in the weekly overviews for accessibility reasons. So let me just say that up front. Uh, you are more than welcome to use these notes but I do not make any guarantees about accessibility. So I, in fact, I'm going to go back and add a note, add a line that says that right here so that those people who uh, need to have access to the, uh, you know, accessible materials, you, I cover the same information in these notes here is just another opportunity for you to interact with learning material. Okay. All right. Um, so, um, the other thing that I did in that announcement was I broke it down. I gave you a link to the, in, you know, the large folder, but I also took the time to pull out just the ones that you needed. All right. So there's some more information on the nature of science. Talks about the idea of, you know, what is science? OK, uh, ways that we can break science down the notion of the problem solving process, because I mentioned to you on Monday that the scientific method is nothing more than a problem solving process. So we get into it uh, in more detail, um, you know, and looking at the, this idea of the scientific method. Um, I emphasize the idea that theories and laws are accepted, you know, uh, because it's the best explanation that we have, but we have to change our, um, you know, we have to revise our knowledge when we get more credible, more and credible information. Um, steps of the scientific method. I gave you a, th this is a set of steps, but you also have access to a set of steps in the notes that I just covered uh, on Monday. Uh, either of these set of steps is, is more than, uh, you know, um, the more than uh, acceptable. OK, um, I went through the same example of the Titanic. In fact, I pulled it. I pulled it, added that example in the packet so you would have it in both places. Um, they talk about the, the experiment. OK, um, you know, talk about the idea in an experiment that it's an organized way of testing a hypothesis. There are some key elements of an experiment, which is one is a control, and you need that control as a standard for comparison, right? So, uh, for example, if you're going to um, if you're going to see look at uh, the effectiveness of one treatment versus another, some some um, part of the population in your experiment will not get the treatment, and and some will. And then you look at the difference in whatever it is you're investigating in those in that population. So and you have to make sure that you have a single variable, right? When you are doing an experiment, you're testing for one thing and you want to keep everything else constant. OK. And then, of course, I mentioned the idea of in an experiment, you you always want to have to repeat things so that you can be, have reliability, which means you know, if everybody's doing the experiment and coming out with the similar results, you that that you can rely on those findings. Okay. And see, 
this is part of why I have you do the project because if uh, you know the idea of the scientific method and an experiment is key to the work that scientists do, I want you to have some firsthand exposure to that. That's why I have you do the project on a on the um, on the research article. Okay, in an experiment, you have two variables: the independent variable that you can adjust as the experimenter, and the dependent variable that responds to your changes. Now, this is a particularly relevant in lab class, and we'll talk about this more in lab class when we talk about graphing. Okay, and so the independent variable you can vary as the experimenter and the dependent variable you cannot control it you can only measure it that's why we need measurement okay and i give an example of an experiment this idea of you know and this again this is me just being over the top it's not that i i think somebody's out there investigating popcorn okay but you know somebody wants to know about you know, how they can make more popcorn pop. And this is what they came up with after doing what? Their research. So they had to research popcorn and find out everything about all them experiments and investigations that have been done with popcorn. And based on that, they've decided that they're going to see whether this will help your popcorn to, to pop better. Maybe nobody else has done this research, done an experiment on this. Okay? Maybe that's the gap in our knowledge. And a lot of times when scientists are working, that's exactly what they're doing. They're looking for, OK, they, they, you know, people have investigated A, B and C. I'm going to fill in the gap by investigating D. OK. And so in this case, they established the control is the popcorn that does not get put in the freezer, but is that is stored at room temperature. Maybe somebody else will come along and say, oh, I don't want to investigate popcorn being put in the freezer. I want to see if I boil it first. And so the control in that case would be the popcorn that doesn't get boiled. And then you will have to, you know, then you will have to make sure that you're investigating the single variable. And in this case, it's the temperature, freezer or no freezer. And then the things you have, there are things that you have to keep constant, right? You don't want to you don't want to be uh, having the possibility for more than one thing clouding your judgment when you are making a decision about your popcorn and whether the freezer helps. So you will have to keep these things all the same for every um, you know set of popcorn that you pop. All right, and so you know they identify for you here the uh, independent and dependent variables. So the storage temperature is what you can vary. But you can't um, you can't determine how many number of kernels are going to pop. You can only count them or measure them. OK, so this is just another set of notes on the nature of science. Feel free to use them as you see fit. Um, there are. There's another set of notes that, you know, gets into this whole idea of science as a way of thinking about the environment. Notice all of these notes basically convey the same information. It's just, you know, made available to you in multiple, in multiple, uh, you know, through multiple avenues, right? Okay. And so you can see, you know, they explain this idea of science, they get to this idea of, of the, the quantitative description that we want to begin going in deeper to uh you know definitely next week or uh, they talk about the idea of the scientific method okay so all of this the same stuff that you've seen before okay all right there's nothing new here it just gets into a little bit of history about the metric system not that we are looking at this from a historical perspective but i always tell students you know you have to one thing you have to remember is Science is not happening in a vacuum. It's ha happening in, you know, in the uh, context of culture. And I, I think today's, uh, you know, uh, dilemma uh, uh, in dealing with the COVID-19, it, it, it drives that point home more than anything, right? I mean, you know, we live in such a, you know, political climate that we've even politicized something like a virus that doesn't vote, that doesn't know anything about parties. 
right? But, you know, when you look at how this came about, you know, hey, what was going on in 1791 that drove them to decide that that's what they needed to do? Something was happening in society that drove that, okay? Uh, again, I don't need you to know the, um, the definition but I do need you to, you know, recognize that there's a base property, a base unit, and an abbreviation for that uh, unit, all right? Uh, we're not, we don't need to go into all of this, but look, I tell folk in this packet, what's nice about it that you don't have access to in other packets for those who need it. It's not in what I cover because everybody doesn't need it. Uh, you can definitely go into this and get somewhat of a math review can do a little bit math review, okay? Because it talks about ratios and all that kind of stuff, okay? So you can go look in, looking at that if you if you want to. There's more information there, okay? All right, and then the last thing that I'll spend some time on today, and I like this packet because it does have a few examples that we can take a look at. Um, the, the supplemental notes that I have, typically they don't work too many examples, but um, I'll look at this and, and pull a couple from it that we can, uh, you can then go back and, and uh, take a look at yourself, you know. So, um, you know, they introduced the idea in this packet of looking at the SI base uh, units and prefixes. And then we'll look, talk about this idea of derived units and we'll end by looking at some dim density calculations. So I got about, uh, what, about 20 minutes, okay? So we'll spend the last 20 minutes looking at this uh, this this body of information. All right. Something that I want to highlight for you is that anytime you measure a quantity or a property of our physical scratch and sniff environment, you are always going to have a number and you're going to have a unit. OK. When you measure, you can't just write down a number and you can't just write down a unit. When you measure, you have to have both. And the unit is just as important, if not more important, than the number. I always tell students, I give you a little bit grace on the number. Okay? I won't totally mark it wrong. But if your unit is wrong, it's wrong. Because if your unit is wrong, you are telling me about the wrong part of my scratch and sniff environment. Okay, you are telling me about the wrong physical property. I didn't ask you about mask. I asked you about time. You gave me the unit of uh, kilograms and you should have said kiloseconds. Okay, so units matter. All right, if your unit is wrong, it's wrong. So again, they highlight the, the base property or quantity the base unit and the abbreviation. Again, I4 are length, mass, time, and temperature. We don't have to worry about current. And you might be thinking at this point, oh, only four things we have to worry about in this class. Ah, if it was only four things, we could finish today and go home. All right. But the base properties and units aren't the issue. It's all the combinations that we make. It's all of those derived properties that we make that, you know, I always tell students, complicate your life, okay? So there are four fundamental properties or quantities that we are interested in, length, mass, time, and temperature. And these are the four fundamental base units and their abbreviations. And then you have the prefixes and their powers of 10. I would say to you that this is probably this watered down version of the chart that I gave you, that you saw earlier, this is probably more representative of the, the ones, the prefixes and powers of 10 that you'll use in this class. We don't, we don't deviate too much. And then we don't use all of these all the time, but this is a much easier chart to manage, right? If you're gonna, uh, you know, uh, be utilizing something to support you, all right? Now, so, if derived units and derived properties are going to complicate your life, let's just get to it right away. And let me bring up my whiteboard because I want to draw you that little smiley face 
chart that you see as the smiley face right here on the screen so you see it okay in other words you see what the smiley faces represent and not just the smiley face because this is a very important okay so i'll come right back to that in just a moment okay so an example of a derived property is volume meaning what we make combinations of the base property so volume i know many times in a math class you'll say length times width times height but width is a length at its core and so is height so at its core volume is formed by doing length times length times length now when you do that you have to recognize that the fundamental property is length, but there are many different units that we can use to measure length. We can use centimeters. So I could do centimeters times centimeters times centimeters, and that's length. I could do inches times inches and times inches, excuse me, uh, centimeters times centimeters times centimeters, and that's centimeters cubed, which is volume. I could do inches times inches times inches. That's inches cubed, and that's volume. I could do miles times miles times miles or kilometers times kilometers times kil kilometers. Some people say kilometers, 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 tomato, tomato, right? The idea is that I take a single length unit and I multiply it times itself three times and I get a cubed length volume. So centimeters cubed, decimeters cubed, inches cubed, feet cubed, mile cubed. I'm taking a length unit and cubing it to get a length volume unit. And then there is a relationship between a length volume and a liquid volume. We typically think of volume as dealing with liquids, right? Milliliters, liters, gallons, pints, quarts, fluid ounces. Those are all examples of volume units and those of you who had me for lab uh, yesterday we spent a little bit time talking about how you could distinguish right because you're using that to help you write your first lab report right but here it is right here the relationship between a length cubic length volume and a liquid volume same thing here one decimeter cubed is equal to one liter okay so that's the relationship between a length volume and a liquid volume, okay? But either of these four are valid units to use for volume, all right? So volume is an example of a derived property. Why? Because we took our base property length and we made a combination, all right? Density. I like to tell students density is a derived derived property because you take your base property mass and you divide it by a derived property volume. So that's why I said all the combinations that you make is where you get the issue. OK, so density is mass per unit volume. And here they give you an example of a density unit grams representing mass divided by centimeters cubed, which represents volume, okay? So you have to take a mass unit and divide by a volume unit to get density. So let me show you what I mean, okay? So um, I'll just write it here, okay? And the nice thing is I will put this link here in today's announcement, and you will be able to come right back to the same page. So let's take a look at some mass units. What we know is gram, grams is one. We can put a prefix on it and say what? Kilograms. We can put another prefix on it and say micrograms, because anytime we put a prefix on it, a prefix of power of 10, that's a mass unit. We have things like ounces that we use in the British system. And then one that you don't see too often, slug. I know it sounds slimy, but it's really a unit. Slugs, okay? 
All right, ooh, that's the ugly S, huh? Let me try to, no, try to do it a little bit neater, okay? Slugs, all right? So these are some examples of mass units. Are there more? Sure, you know about what? Um, well, you could put any prefix on it, right? Okay, now volume units. We already talked about some. Ooh, that's ugly. That's the thing I have to get used to is writing on a whiteboard. Okay, volume. Some examples of some volume units, okay? Well, we know we have, we saw earlier, milliliters. We have liters. We could put a prefix on it and have what? Um, deciliters. Okay, we can have kiloliters. These are all examples of volume units, and I just made a unit just by putting a prefix on it. Uh, we have, you know, in this country, we have what? Quarts, gallons, okay, um, we have fluid ounces, F-L-O-Z, fluid ounces, okay. So these are all examples of volume units. Are there others? Sure. Cups, you know, you know that we, there are others that we utilize in this, uh, utilize in the English system, uh, pints, right? But uh, in the metric system, milliliters, liters, deciliters, kiloliters, put a prefix on it, okay? Now the question becomes, well then, how do we get these density units, okay? So density, and the formula for density is D equal M over V. Now I want you to be careful there because a lot of times when I ask students the formula, they write out the words. A formula is written in symbol format. So these are the symbols that we use to express the density formula. The D stands for density, the M for mass, and the V for volume, right? So if I put here M and here V, okay? Then if I take M over V, I get density D. So now the question becomes, well, what are some examples of density units? Well, I just need to pull one from this category and divide it by one from this category. So some units, grams per centimeter cube. Okay, Ooh, that's ugly. Let me do that again. Okay, all right. I could do um, I could do ounces per fluid ounce. Why not? I could do that because I took one from this category divided by one from this category. I could do um, here kilograms per liter. Why not? I took one from mass and I took one from volume and I divided them. Okay. Um, and so on and so forth, you know. I could do um, grams, why not? Oh, oh, well, I gotta write it better than that first. Okay, grams per gallon. Okay, grams per gallon, can do that. One from this category divided by one from this category. So when I take a mass unit and divide by a volume unit, I get a density unit. Now, what you don't see in the smiley face, the picture here is what the smiley faces represent. I call this my problem solving pyramid, problem solving pyramid, because it's a way to simplify the algebra. This class, 
We don't do a whole lot of high level algebra at all. We do some very simplistic algebra that can typically be modeled using this pyramid mean typically in a formula we have three variables. OK, and what this does is tell me how to get um, one variable if I cover it up and utilize the other two. So if I cover up mass, because that's the one I'm looking for, then it tells me I have to multiply density times volume. If I want volume, I cover it up and it tells me I have to take mass and divide by density. Okay, And if I want density, I cover it up and it tells me I take mass divided by volume. So if they're right next to each other, I multiply. If they're on top of each other, it means divide. So I don't need to know how to solve and I don't need to know how to do algebraic equations. I just need to know how to multiply and divide. OK, and so I always encourage students, especially if it's been a minute since you've had to do some math to utilize the problem solving pyramid as a way to simplify the math that's involved. OK, all right. So in the last few minutes that I have, I'm going to look at three examples that utilize the problem solving pyramid to solve some math problems that deal with derived property density okay and the reason i'm doing this is because on your problem set number one you are going to see you are going to see this concept of density and you are going to have to solve three problems that deal with density and if you come back and look at these examples then you will be able to do it okay all right so it says an object has a volume of 825 centimeters cubed and a density of 13.6 grams per centimeter cube. Find its mass. OK, so in this case, we're looking for the mass M. So we cover it up in our problem solving pyramid and we multiply the density times the volume. We were given both of those. We multiply them. And in the process, we have to cancel out our centimeters cubed because we have centimeters cubed on top, centimeters cubed on the bottom. They cancel out. And we are left with 11,220 grams. So if you are doing homework on problem set number one and you have to solve for mass, you can come back and look at this example. OK. All right. Example number two. A liquid has a density of 0 0.8, 0 0.87 grams per milliliter. What volume is occupied by 25 grams of the liquid? OK, so in this case, we are looking for the volume. So we have to cover it up in our pyramid and it tells us divide mass by density. M over D, 25 grams divided by 0.87 grams per milliliter. That gives me 28.7 milliliters. The number part, handy dandy calculator, the grams cancel out and we're left with milliliters. And then finally, because I want to leave a few minutes for questions, you have a sample with a mass of 620 grams and a volume of 753 centimeters cubed. Find the density. Well, in this particular case, we are looking for density, so we cover it up and we divide mass by volume because mass is on the top, volume is on the bottom, okay? So that's 620 grams divided by 753 centimeters cubed. Nothing cancels in this case. So the number part gives us 0 0.82 and the unit part is just grams per centimeter cubed. OK, so um, when you're working, you have these as examples of how do you utilize the derived property formula for density. And density is a very important property because it helps us to identify materials in our scratch and sniff environment because every material has its own density. OK, and we'll see several properties or quantities that we can measure that are unique to each individual substance or material as we proceed through this class. All right. So uh, that's all I have for you. We have roughly about five minutes. Uh, if you have a question, please feel free to unmute your mic and ask your question.
I have a question have a about, question about the lab. lab. Okay, well, let's wait till after we're done and then you can ask me that question. Anybody else? Question about the lecture. All right, so I'm going to, I've unshared my screen. Again, I will post the recording for today's class in the announcements along with the link to the whiteboard that I utilize. And you already have a link to the notes, the extra notes that I shared with you today. Uh, so feel free to take a look at them. Uh, uh, just as a last bit of, uh, let me go into the weekly overview just to, just to make sure that I'm thorough here. So nature of science. If you go in the required readings viewings, look, there also there's also a link to sample density problems there. That's why I said you have access to everything you need right here. So I've also put sample density problems in the event that you don't want to use these examples. OK. Questions? Oh, I'm sorry, I wasn't sharing. I wasn't sharing at that moment. I, you didn't see that. Let me let me. Let me do a quick share and show you that. Here you can see the required readings viewings for this week's overview. There's a link to some uh, some sample density problems there as well in the event that you don't want to use these examples. So questions. All right, if you don't have any questions, you're free to go. Uh, I'll see you back here on Monday at two o'clock. Yes, ma'am. You do the same. And the gentleman, a good one. Yes, you too. The gentleman that had a question about lab, feel free to unmute your mic and go ahead and ask your question. Um, okay, so I got a question about the um, first one, the era analysis. Yes, okay. Let me bring that class up and I'll share my screen and we can take a look at it. Okay. Bear with me, I'm getting to it here. Right. Okay. And your question is about what? Um, so on the lab experiment, there's volume and there's mass. Do we have to do both that mass and volume? Yes. Okay, and so for so the, the information, the, the lab report requires that you use that you complete all of this, and there's mass and there's volume. Right, you have volume data, mass data, volume analysis, and mass analysis, and it tells you that what you can use my sample data or make your own measurements. Okay, so would you need two separate procedures then? Because it is, yeah, it's like different forms. Okay, yeah. so I would have to yeah. do those questions, all those questions twice, right? So these questions right here, so you can you can answer the question all in one, but you can just like maybe have two different paragraphs, right? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, you're welcome, sir. I apologize. Anybody else, feel free to ask a question. All right, if you don't have any questions for me, Zachary, Hunter, Keaton, and Cooper, we're all done. I have a question. When is that lab report due? Um, Saturday. OK, I didn't go check. I just wanted to make sure. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Keaton, do you have a question for me? Eaten. 
All right. So if you don't have a question, our class is over with. So I'm going to stop the recording.